Let's start off and just take a little look at this. Very adorable. How many of you got kids or grandkids that do precisely this? Yeah, I have a one-year-old and a three-and-a-half-year-old. My three-and-a-half-year-old surfs YouTube for garbage truck videos the entire time. My one-year-old is basically doing this type of stuff. But there's a real deep, interesting thing going on here. In fact, there are two very deep, interesting things. First question is, how much language did it take this little girl to learn how to do this? It's a very simple one-word answer. None. Absolutely zero. At this age, there is no real language going on. So she was able to learn to do this relatively you know, complex thing that I know some other people have a little more difficulty with adjusting to new technology at the age of one with no language, which kind of should be a little cue there that something rather interesting is happening. So how did she learn how to do this? Nobody told her. What was the process? How did she learn? Oh, I heard an interesting one. What was that? Trial and error. Basically, by doing, by going, that worked or that didn't work, seeing it happen, doing it again and again and again and again, learning by doing, learning. And of course, part of the advantage there is that the tool that she's got, what does the tool do? When she does something, what happens? It reacts. There's feedback. So if she does something, there's feedback, there's like a loop, and this basically is a neuroscience, the perception action cycle. She perceives, she acts, she gets feedback on that, it changes her perception, and she acts again. Very powerful. It's actually the root of all learning. We just kind of tend to clog it up with other stuff in the way. Something else really interesting, what's she doing right now? She's trying to grab, and, but what, is she trying to grab on the device that she learned how to do this? She's transferring. So this is the holy grail of math teaching, to basically teach kids how to do something in one context and to have them transfer that learning to another context. This is incredibly difficult to do. I know it because I taught math for many, many years. And this notion that somehow we could get kids to learn something themselves and then transfer it to a new context is great, but it is really hard. So this is fabulous. That means that iPads are awesome and they have solved the education problem and we can all go home, um, and that's great. What's the problem with this graph? Is the blue line a good line? No. So basically what this is saying, and, and this is in fact a graph of expenditure on technology in um, US K-12 system since the 70s, and you can see it's this. Anybody know mathematically what type of curve this is? It's total silence. No, there wasn't total silence. Somebody said it back there. Exponential. Absolutely. It's an exponential curve. Exponential growth in technology spending. And is the blue line an exponential curve? No, it's not. Um, mathematically, what would it be? Linear, yes. With a, with a slope of practically zero, in fact, would be kind of where we're going. So this is, in fact, the NAEP assessment scores for mathematics during the same period. So you'll notice there's a little bit of a dichotomy between the amount of money being spent on technology and potentially this impact that it's having in the classroom, which you might think is a really interesting slide for somebody who's part of a technology company in education to bring up as their second slide. Um, but there's a reason for this. And I think this picture captures the essence of the major problem here better than anything I could say. This is a French artist's depiction of what they thought school would look like en la an de mille, with my best high school French kicking back in with a vengeance. So in the year 2000, this is what they thought education would look like in the year 2000. And just absorb that, because it's a little scary. Just think about it for a minute. Here you've got the teacher, who in their mind is still very much the font of all knowledge, who is putting the books into a machine. The information is getting ground up into presumably bite-sized chunks and then piped directly into the heads of the students. Does that sound a little eerily familiar to a lot of systems? Well, what's wrong with that vision of education? Because there's a whole technology thing. Presumably, the kids are getting just in time. They're getting personalized learning, whatever it is. But what's, what's the major dramatically wrong thing with that vision of education? 
It's passive. The whole point is that it envisions the idea that learning for the student is a passive activity where they sit and accept this knowledge and just kind of absorb it like a sponge. And does that work? No. For those of you, and I'm sure most of you, who have been in the classroom, and I'm sure we've all done our best lectures ever, and we thought, wow, that was so cool. I just derived the equation of an ellipse on the board for my students, and I turn around to look at how much of it they absorb, and the entire class is asleep. So it's, it's, a, it's a terrible instructional model. What we really want is we want students to be actively engaged in the learning process. That little girl with the iPad, her entire learning process was active. And in fact, for all students, they need to be active and they need to be doing stuff themselves. This is just, but unfortunately, most technology, the reason we haven't seen much change in test scores, the vast majority of it unfortunately mimics this type of learning model. Just because there's a new delivery system does not mean that the instructional model has changed. So we're gonna try something that hopefully will be rich, different, and exciting right now. Let's start playing. The objective of the game is very simple. You've got a block, you've got some rubber bands, and you've got to figure out using, you know, you can drag, you can position the bands anywhere on, you can basically attach them to these things. The name of the penguin is GG. And the objective of pretty much every game is to figure out how are you going to get GG to the other side. So in this instance, you attach the bands where you think they might go, the block gets pulled into the ground, or maybe it does, and you try and get GG across. So, so this looks like it's a good place for this one to go. So the question really comes now, where does this other band go? So, and why does it go wherever it's going to go? What do you think? So, so this is an interesting one. This is the, so obviously you can see this one is four spaces from the end of the block. So the next natural place to try is to maybe put it four spaces from the end of the hole. This is a, a this is linear thinking, where basically it's four away, four away. Do you think this is going to work? No, it's going to be too big again. Because what are the rubber bands doing to the block? They're stretching it. And are they stretching different parts, different amounts? Or are they stretching the entire block the same amount? It's an interesting question. It actually stretches the entire block, like whatever it does. So however much it stretches this piece here, it's going to stretch the rest of it exactly the same. It's like a concertina. So how big is the block right now? How many squares? And how big is this hole? How big? Someone had it just now. 12, absolutely. So effectively, what do we have to do to the block to get it to fill the hole? We have to double it. So therefore, what have we got to do this to the space between the bands? Yes. Yes, that's exactly right. That intuition was spot on. We've got to double it. So if the space between the bands is two, we need to put the bands how far apart down the bottom? Four. We are now officially as smart as sixth graders. Um, anybody know what kind of mathematics this is? What, what type of, and we're going to see it's going to work. You're going to do it. It's going to be cool. Whoa, how about that? Excellent, fantastic, good job. What mathematics are we talking about here? Ratios, proportional reasoning, proportional thinking. The old way of teaching this was to go, right, we're going to set up a proportion. I don't know if anybody you remember sort of proportions. And then we're going to cross multiply. Any, anybody familiar with that? How much did that help you with this puzzle? Not a lot. Not a lot. So we'll look at some of the whys as to why that's a dreadful method. This is kind of a whole different way of working. So kids need this. They need that active engagement. The, you know, the enthusiasm they feel when they are the ones in charge of the process is fantastic. The teacher is now facilitating, and the students really, really enjoy mathematics. This is a good thing. Thank you very, very much. Please come talk to us anytime, and we'll see you later on today.